You're listening to the Hazard Ground Podcast, with service members from across the military, sharing their stories of combat and survival. And now, here's your host, Mark Zeno. Welcome into the Hazard Ground Podcast. As always, we appreciate you joining us each and every week. Before we get started with this week's episode, we hope everybody out there is being safe, everybody out there is healthy, and everybody is doing everything they possibly can to stop the spread of this coronavirus and really help turn the corner with what we're dealing with right now in America. It's going to take everybody's effort. It's going to take a whole lot of work, and we really do sincerely hope that you guys are doing your part as well is that you are healthy, your family and loved ones are healthy and safe and avoiding the coronavirus as best as you can. With that, and social distancing, and isolation, and all these other things, and quarantine, if you're looking for some stuff to do, why don't you tell a friend about this podcast? Maybe when you're going out for a walk, or you know, just going for a drive somewhere just to get out of the house and move around, tell somebody about this podcast, an episode that you liked, and maybe they'll download it and listen. That'll help grow this Hazard Ground community. So that's really important to us, and maybe you know, you can help pass the time during these sort of static times where we are right now by letting somebody else know about this podcast. If you want to start reading something, go to our website, hazardground.com, and check out our book list. All the guests on this show who have written a book, that book and a link to it is right there on the website. So check it out if you're looking for something new to read. As well, maybe if you really have some free time and you want to start a movie, on our website, hazardground.com, we have a list of movies by guests on this podcast. Maybe starting Will Gardner, maybe Sandcastle, maybe some of the other movies that you know from books and guests we've had on this podcast. It's worthwhile to check it out. You got some extra free time. Use the Hazard Ground podcast as a way to help you get through this coronavirus mess that we're in and hopefully pass the time in a positive and inspirational way. One final note, don't forget about our promotion with Amazon. Go to our website again, hazardground.com. Do all your normal Amazon shopping. We get a percentage of what you spend. We donate it right back to some of the charities you've heard featured here on the Hazard Ground. Follow us on social media, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Subscribe on YouTube. And with all that out of the way, let's get on to this week's episode. Joining us this week is a retired Air Force Master Sergeant who was a pararescueman jumper, spent 20 years in the Air Force, nine deployments overseas, including Iraq, Afghanistan, and the Philippines. He is credited with over 5,000 rescues throughout his entire career. One of his most noted rescues was during Hurricane Katrina. He is Mike Maroney joining us on the Hazard Ground Podcast. Mike, welcome. Thank you so much for being here. Good morning, sir. Thank you for having me. All right. Well, uh, we've talked to several PJs before, uh, and PJ meaning power rescue and jumpers. And actually, for those listening, uh, Mike is a guest suggestion from Kevin Wallace, who was an Air Force combat photographer. You can hear his story in episode 146. But you guys knew each other well uh, throughout your careers. And certainly Kevin's story is fantastic and excited to hear yours as well. So tell me uh, how and when you got your start in the Air Force. I came in in 96. Uh, I was 21. But the uh, the reason I joined the Air Force, my father was in the Army, and the best advice he ever gave me was join the Air Force. And when I was seven, I told him that I wanted to be a Ranger. And uh, my dad, uh, it's pretty good that, you know, I, I'm happy that he knew uh, the kind of person I was. And he said, no, you want to be a PJ. And I'm like, what's a PJ? He said, these dudes get to do all the same training as SEALs and Rangers and SF and go to all the same schools, but their entire job is uh, rescue. They're there to help people. And I thought, that sounds pretty good, you know? Um, so I, you know, was a kid and did my stuff. And uh, as I got a little bit older, you know, felt I hadn't done much to earn my freedom or, you know, my keep in the country. So I thought to, uh, to pay my debt, I'd join the Air Force and, uh, I, this this job was more of a calling than a job, uh, and I, I went for it. So it was pre-9-11 when you signed up. Any other motivations? I mean, it wasn't to pay for college or anything like that, because obviously we were in a country at war at that point in time. Right. No, um, I joined because I like to help people, and I heard that this was a really good job that gave you the opportunity to do that kind of stuff. You know, And, and uh, you ever seen the movie uh, Say Anything? Yes. So you remember he's, he says he's looking for his dare to be great situation. Mm-hmm. That that was what pararescue offered to me. It was like my my chance to to give back to the the world, um, and and it was awesome. 
All right. So we often joke, as military people do, about the Air Force and its sort of lack of physical prowess. But you had you had decided to go through a completely different route. When you went to Air Force boot camp, were you surprised about anything? Boot camp was pretty easy. Mm -hmm. um, And I I slept through most of it. Uh, (laughs) I haven't heard that uh, one before. (laughs) I, I, I got my revenge back on me by going through our indoctrination course three times in a row. For PJ, yes, sir. Okay, so when when do you finish boot camp, and how quickly do you get to PJ school? So uh, came in September eleventh, nineteen ninety six. Uh, graduated from basic about mid October. Um, by late October, we so the the school was uh, here on Lackland. Now it's on Medina, which is an annex across the way. But uh, it was here, so I just hopped on a bus, and they took me to the other side of base. And I had about a month before the class started. We started, uh, I think, the day or two before Thanksgiving. And and then we went all the way through um, Christmas break. And uh, the, the basic training did not prepare me. So as I tell guys these days, during basic training, do more. You know, or when they give you the opportunity to work out, do more. And that will help you out because uh, it's just the regular Air Force level of uh, fitness isn't what you need for a uh, job like pararescue or combat control. All right. So when you get to uh, PJ school, I mean, we, we've heard stories about, you know, SEALs and, and guys who are in special forces and hell week and all that. Is there a version of that in PJ school? Uh, yes. They, um, they used to have a hell day where well, they had a hell week. Then they had a hell day. Uh, the reason, like the numbers, we don't have, you know, I'm, Every SEAL class starts with, you know, a lot of guys, and we only start with about 100. So they found that if a guy didn't quit within the first 23 hours, he wasn't going to quit, so he was more likely to get injured. So they started doing uh, just a a day. Um, And then now they have a called uh, assessment selection. So now they only – it's 15 days straight of about 21 hours a day uh, of, of hell week. And but when I went through, uh, you just had a, a day and a night. Uh, they were pretty heinous. It was ten weeks of uh, run, you know, every day run, swim, drown, uh, get stepped on, get told you're too short, genetically inferior, uh, smile and say, "Who ya, Sergeant?" You know, and keep on going. <laughs> wow. All right. So as you start going through school, you said you had to kind of be recycled three times. What were the reasons? So the first time I was not a very good bobber. We used to bob with we used to um, bob with tanks, and the tanks were forty pounds of lead, and you had your uh, your fins on, and you walked down to the bottom of the pool. You started bobbing; it was pretty easy. Uh, then they said switch, and you had to take off your um, your uh, fins and put them on your hands. And now I had to push myself up uh, above the water to get my breath. And uh, I was not very good at that. I'm, I'm about five five, so I'm not the very uh, not very tall individual. Uh, the tanks, the the water level was at my ears, so somebody would have to uh, tap me on the shoulder to say, "Hey, it was time to go," so I could bob down. And I, I made it to the uh, third day of the sixth week, and uh, I finally had my third quit by action. So I became a really good treader. Because if you can tread with your hands up with 40 pounds of lead and just your uh, legs, I think you can do pretty good. And and I was like, well, I'm not quitting because I'm staying out in the water and I'm doing my best. And But I was quitting because I wasn't you know completing the action. So um, on the day that I get set back, the next day, it's Thursday, I'm, I'm in line with eight other guys. And one of them is uh, a guy named Ivan Ruiz. And Ivan Ruiz, about two years ago, uh, received the Air Force Cross, was with an ODA team in uh, Afghanistan, did some really, really cool stuff. And on, on on this day, he and seven other guys are in front of me, and one by one, everybody goes, doesn't get picked up, doesn't get picked up, doesn't get picked up. And I'm thinking, all those dudes were taller and stronger than me. There's no way I'm getting to go. I walk into the back, and you know, they make fun of me and talking crap. And uh, I'm like, who are you, Sergeant? You know, I just really want to be here. This is the job I want to do. And because my push-ups weren't too bad, uh, they said, okay, we'll give you another chance. We don't think you're going to make it, but, you know, we'll give you another chance because somebody, one of the instructors had, had spoke up for me. 
And this is what I tell dudes. I'm like, when you're at this school, every day is a, is your job interview. You know, every day you've got to prove yourself. So every day you need to be doing your best, you know, and, and not just to, to show them that you're doing your best. You need to actually do your best. And so they let me go. Um, and two days later, I started back on the next team day one and uh, hopped back in. And on that one, I made it all the way to the final um, must. Well, I made it to the final. So 10 weeks I'm there and I had um, hurt myself a little bit. I sprained my ankle um, on about the sixth week we went, we did the San Antonio half marathon. And so on the third mile, I rolled my ankle. And so from six week on, I'm 4,000 milligrams of Motrin wrapping up my, uh, my ankle. And I actually find out uh, a couple months later that I broke it. But you know, when you're going through these courses, you don't want to get set back. You don't want to go to medical. So, you know, I hobbled and I did everything, made it to the last, uh, eval it's a six mile run in 42 30 i made it in 42 29 uh it was about may and i was sweating like it was july <laughs> and the instructors had kind of been looking at me going hmm we got the pull-ups uh i jumped up onto the bar got seven or eight pull-ups slipped off the bar fell down landed on my ankle and just started crying i was, I was in so much pain i'm like oh so they they sent me to medical um, they were like, uh, what do you want to do? I'm like, I want to stay in this course. So, uh, the doc sent me back, said, you know, sprained ankle, you know, I, I didn't want an x-ray or anything. I wanted to get back, went back, talked to the, uh, the commandant, begged them. Uh, there were two combat controllers and they were like, uh, all right, we don't think you're going to make it, but we'll let you go again. Uh, they gave me two weeks to heal threw me back on the next team. And on that team, I finally graduated. Wow. Guess I, a sense of relief when, uh, you finally got through all this. I mean, was there a point where you didn't think, Hey, this might not happen. With just about every day, I was pretty sure it wasn't going to happen, but that didn't stop me every day. You know, I mean, that's pararescue. You, you need that kind of maybe un, unrealistic optimism, but, that's what people need when they're dying. You need to be like, don't worry, we got this. We're going to be fine. You know, I'm working on you, yada, yada, yada. And, uh, you know, you keep people alive. You got to have that willpower for two people. And, and I think I learned that early and I definitely going back again and again helped me later on in life. You know, it helps me all the time because I'm like, well, I survived that. So what can't I survive? Yeah. I mean, look, Hey, uh, <laughs> Nothing, nothing worthwhile comes easy, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> That's kind of the, the, the motto here. All right. So you finally get to uh, call yourself a PJ. Um, where are you on nine eleven? Because you know this is still pre nine eleven when you graduate, correct? Yes. Right. Yes. Yeah. So uh, I graduated in ninety eight. It takes about two years to go through the pipeline. Um, got to go to Army Dive School. Love that. That was a great school in free fall. And so uh, on 9-11, I am stationed in Valdosta, Georgia at Moody Air Force Base, uh, which is a horrible place. The, the only good thing about it is it's about an hour and a half from Jacksonville, so I could go surfing on the weekends. But there's mosquitoes. It's ugly. It's uh, The, the Okefenokee Swamp is right there. And uh, so on 9-11, I went to the gym, was working out, and just had like this weird bad feeling in my stomach. And I was like, uh so I wasn't feeling it, so I jogged back to the uh, the you know squadron, and as I'm walking by, there are a bunch of dudes in the break room, and they're watching the, the news, and I'm like, All right, what are you guys doing? And right as I walk in, the second plane crashes into the building, and I'm like, what? Uh, and they're like, dude, this is the second one. I'm like, the second one? They're like, yeah, and, you know, and they, everybody starts talking about you know planes and, and stuff going on. And I was like, holy moly, you know, because... I, I kind of, you know, you had Bosnia and Kosovo at the time, but that really wasn't doing much. Um, we had Northern and Southern Watch, but that was just sitting around. So, uh, you know, you, you work in these jobs, whether you're, you know, a fireman or a paramedic or a PJ, you know, or a SEAL, and you're waiting to go do your big mission, you know, but there's no no wars and nothing bad going on. So you're like, well, I guess, all right, you know, I'll just do my time and do whatever. I was kind of always a mission magnet for peacetime missions. Always had people sick and dying around me. So it worked out pretty good. <laughs> and, uh, 
And so then 9-11 happens and, you know, Mike Maltz, uh, he's a, he was a really good PJ died in Oh three. Uh, he said, pack your boy, uh, pack your bags, boys. We're going to war. And, and, if, and we had dudes left the next day. Wow. Really? Yeah. What was your, I mean, were you one of the guys who felt like I wanted to get in the fight immediately? Uh, or were you just want to just kind of trying to figure out exactly what was going to happen next? Oh no, no. I, I was ready to go and I wanted to go. Uh, so my first son was born on October 11th, 2001. Oh my God. So yeah. So on September 11th, I'm like, Oh dude. So on the 12th and I had volunteered for everything. So I'd been a PJ you know, for two years and I had 300 days a year. I was gone and I volunteered for everything. Just send me, I'll go classes, you know, whatever. And so I, I felt bad and I had to go to my, my supervisor and say, can I go on the second trip? And, uh, he was like, yeah, yeah, that's cool. You know, cause I, I didn't want to miss the, the birth of my son. I, I, you know, service for herself, uh, you know, I'm all about that. And if it'd been like a trip that nobody wanted to go on and, you know, it, it then I, I wouldn't have called off, but everybody wanted to go. So it wasn't hard to say, can I just go on a second trip so I can see him born and, and then I'll go. And, and they were like, yeah, that's cool. Don't, don't worry about it. So how quickly do you get to a deployment? So I deployed uh, the 29th of December and was in country by like the 31st. We were in Pakistan. Okay. Uh, give me a typical day while you're there as a PJ. I mean, are you kind of just sitting around waiting for something bad to happen from the standpoint of you need to go out and do a mission? Or is there some sort of routine sort of, uh, for lack of a better term, you know, battle rhythm, if you will, that you were going through every day? Right. So... We're usually on alert. There's there's six, seven dudes, um, and you're on alert six days a week, and you get one day off. Everybody gets a different day off. And, uh, you know, it lets you relax, take a little bit downtime, I guess. I mean, you're not really off. You're just not on alert. And so on that one, I was on a C-130 mission. So we typically flew, and we flew all over. Uh, we were a jump team uh, waiting to jump into whatever. Uh, some of the guys I was with got some good missions um, and you so you'd fly around, come back, work out. Uh, a lot of guys like to play Xbox. Um, I think the not a bad thing, but the the thing that people have problems with to rescue is that you do sit around a lot waiting for something bad to happen. So you kind of like, you know, I don't want anything bad to happen, but if somebody could just, you know, maybe need a band aid or something, so we could go do something, that would be fine with me. But you, uh, it's a lot of sitting around and it drives a lot of the young guys kind of crazy. Um, you know, cause they played maybe too much call of duty or something and, and thought that, you know, pair rescues being a seal or being a green beret, uh, they have similarities, but you know, we wait around a lot to do, uh, what we need to do. So drives a lot of people nuts. So, uh, I like to read books. Used to read it a lot. Um, we would, uh, we would have suntan ops at three o'clock. We would <laughs> go sit outside you know, if we weren't flying that day or something and just, uh, work out, made swords, beat up each other, pusel sticks, um, you know, just waiting for the call. Kind of sure. like a, think about like a fire department. Sure. Yeah. You know, you yeah. drive by and you see them playing volleyball and stuff. Um, just staying, you know, mentally and physically capable. So do you remember your first rescue in country? I do. So my first rescue would have been um, during uh, Northern Watch in um, Turkey. But my, my first uh, rescue for um, uh, 9-11 was uh, we went and picked up some kids that had gotten blown up. And uh, so we gave them medical attention and then transported them to a, a you know higher level of medical treatment. But tell me, like, about the rescue. It's, I mean, are you nervous on this? How many have you done to this point? Um, I'm probably in the low 90s at this point. That often, really? Uh, yeah, you'd be surprised. Uh, my and my, I I send this or I sense trends with dudes. Like, I I got a friend who's got every crash that happened. Um, I got another buddy's. You know, just a lot of ticks. Uh, for me, it was uh, kids, kids in landmine fields, kids in um, burned, uh, kids dipped in water that was too hot, so their third-degree burns all the way down on their body. Uh, just 
I mean, you know what war is. And, mm-hmm. and so imagine, you know, innocent women and children, just wrong place, wrong time. And uh, that was what, what got me a lot. I was going to ask, were you ever on a rescue mission where your own life was in danger? So I have heard five times, oh, shit, we're going to die. And uh, luckily I didn't. But, uh, yeah, a lot of... Um, well, who's, who fun. said it? One of your teammates or like the pilot? <laughs> Uh, the pilot, the okay, gunner. That's, see, I would be more scared about the pilot saying it than anybody else. Yes, yes. You know, or, or somebody that was really paying attention to what the pilot was doing. Um, what's funny is, so uh, I, I have 5,324 people that I've saved. Um, I've never shot at anybody, but I've been shot at a whole lot. Okay. And I'm not so sure I like those like, odds, to be honest with you. <laughs> <laughs> the math I doesn't never, seem to be in your favor. I've, I've had the opportunity and it just, you know, the, my last time in Iraq, we were flying over this square and there was a a guy with an RPG and he was surrounded by women and he was, you know, had a beat on us. And so we're flying and the gunner and I both looked down and, you know, I thought about it and he thought about it, but I don't know if you know about shooting from helicopters, especially when you're flying really fast. Um, that's why we fly so fast is the hopes that, you know, we don't have to do much. And we both look down and life goes real, real slow. And I'm just like in my head, I'm like, I am not shooting some dude. One, you know, I didn't think I could make it, but two, the idea, you know, of shooting innocent women, you know, who are just around this guy who's, who's using them. And I, I just like, uh, so the gunner and I talked about it. We, we talked about it a couple of times. I'm like, I just, it wasn't, it wasn't worth it. You know, I'd, I'd rather die doing the right thing than, uh, than not. So, um, so we didn't do it, but a lot of times getting shot at very interesting. Uh, when I was 19, I actually was a bouncer in a bar. They thought I was 21 and my, my partner and I, we got into the middle of a, a gang fight and we threw one group out. And so the, the group went and got their guns and they came back and they started shooting and I just froze and just, you know, I was 19 years old, uh, grew up California by the beach, you know, middle-class lifestyle. I'm like, Whoa. And, uh, so the first time I got shot at in, uh, Iraq, uh, Afghanistan, so I just laughed. I'm like, Hey, this is pretty cool. You know? <laughs> And, uh, and wasn't really scared by it because I, you know, I was well armored in a helicopter and, you know, uh, with, with good dudes. So I was like, eh, we'll be all right. Okay. Um, obviously, you know, you, you don't get injured or, and you make it out of your first deployment. Um, how many more deployments do you have until 2005? I'm just curious because Air Force uh, deployments are, are typically the shortest, but are PJ deployments shorter than a regular Air Force deployment? So our deployments are four to six months. So say this year, January to, to May or June, I'm I'm deployed. July through December, I'm spinning up to go on my next deployment, which will be okay. the next January. So you're on about a yearly deployment cycle. So f- let's see, uh, 01, Pakistan, uh, I, I TDY, I pcs to the uh, to Kadena on Okinawa in July. In September, I'm in uh, the Philippines. Uh, oh two, so there's oh three, oh four. I'm coming back over. I'm in. I'm um, oh, sorry. You're yeah. We're oh four. Uh, I'm I'm in Vegas, and I go to Iraq in oh four. Afghanistan 05, and then back to uh, Iraq 06. Okay. Uh, and the reason I bring up 05, as I mentioned earlier, one of your most notable rescues of your 5,000 plus was during Hurricane Katrina. Uh, and obviously it ends with a, a very happy ending. Um, but take me through the beginning of Hurricane Katrina before it actually hits land. I mean, are you guys thinking that this is a mission that you're going to be called upon? I mean, what's what are you hearing prior to Katrina making landfall? So we we all get rounded up, and they're like, pack your bags, <laughs> we're going. And within 18 hours, we left. And uh, I know you're in the Army. I don't know if how hard it is to get orders in the Army, but in the Air Force, it usually takes like two to three weeks. It's got to go routed this, here, there. 
And we left without orders. So we left on verbal orders. And within 18 hours, we left Vegas and uh, flew cross country. And within 24 hours, uh, so six hours later, we dropped off all our stuff at a um, Air National Guard base in Jackson, Mississippi, and flew straight to uh, New Orleans and started working. All right. So as this thing is making landfall, and you're, we're all starting to get the scope of this thing. And by the way, I, I was so not paying attention to any of it because I was in the middle of Baghdad when Katrina hit. So it was like <laughs> it was the furthest thing from our minds. Um, right. You know, I, mean, I remember seeing it in the chow hall and just, you know, because they had the news on how bad it was. But, um, you know, I didn't really get the scope of how bad it was based off of news coverage from where we were. So when this thing is starting to make landfall and you're seeing how massive this thing is and the amount of damage that's going, I mean, I mean you, you guys have to be thinking that, hey, we're, we're the only people capable of doing this job, right, to a certain extent? Uh, yes and no. Uh, Coast Guard rescue swimmers, Navy rescue swimmers, uh, anybody with a helicopter. Like, yeah, but there's was, not a lot of you guys, though, right? There's like, not I a mean, lot of us, no. It's... <laughs> I could deploy a standard brigade and, you know, we're talking, uh, you know, around 2000 troops, right? I mean, that's, there's a, I don't think there's 2000 combined power rescue and jumpers, coast guard rescue swimmers and Navy rescue swimmers altogether. Right. Yeah. It might, it's probably not that many. So they're probably about active duty right now, about 500 PJs. Yeah. So and we're not talking big numbers. No, it was, it was crazy. So before the war, we used to do um, ride-alongs in New Orleans, and you'd, you'd work with the health department. You were on whatever ship they were on, and uh, you were hard crewed with them, and great call. I mean, just, you know, so before I got to see, you know, wartime, people getting shot up, I, I'd already, you know, guy got shot five times. People just shot all the time and all kinds of stuff, so it was, it was, I was pretty well prepared. But we got to spend, you know, months at a time in New Orleans. So I knew people, I delivered babies there. Um, I actually, one of the other people that I picked up during Katrina was a, a lady who I delivered her baby. And when I brought her up on the, uh, the hoist, she recognized me and she's like, boo. I'm like, Hey, how are you? You know, gave her a hug. And Wait, when and, you uh, said delivered her baby, what do you mean? I mean, she had a baby in the back of the ambulance in New Orleans when I was there. Uh, and this is before hurricane Katrina. Yes. Okay. I, I didn't know that you were authorized to deliver babies. Yeah, so we're, we're uh, paramedics, nationally registered. Oh, okay. And uh, so once once a year, you got to go, you know, refresh and all your stuff. So you know, once a year, you're either going to a, a paramedic refresher or you're you know going to St. Louis or going to New Orleans and uh, you know working. I, I did. I, it makes sense, but it just like never dawned on me that a paramedic would understand how to help a woman in trouble deliver a baby it just you know i'm thinking save my life not bring another one into the world (laughs) right well you don't want to you don't want to be delivering babies because that's oh everything can go wrong yeah but um you know but it's it's a pretty fun kind of cool i guess trick (laughs) to know yeah again Um, uh, it's not something i have in my toolkit to say the least um so the hurricane passes through. How quickly are you guys in this thing, and what is it like? Just you know, the initial beginning of the operation for you. Right. So it's still raining, and uh, guys from Florida, because we had a we got a team in Herbie, and we got a team in um, Cocoa Beach, and so they're all there, and everybody else is headed that way. I mean, they had uh, highway patrolmen from California and uh, Montana. But so uh, I had seen New Orleans, you know, in, in its regular form, not underwater. And when we pull into or fly above and, and all I see is everything is underwater and or it's on fire. And even if it's underwater, it's still on fire. And there are people in trees, in buildings. I mean, just everywhere. Um, it, it was kind of. In, in a way, I think it was overwhelming, but I, I kind of think of like a, a picture and I, I only see what I need to see when I'm doing something. And I, so I focus, you know, and I'm like, all right, don't, don't worry about 3000 people worry about one, you know, kind of like when you're moving out of a house and you're everything, where do I start? Just pick a spot and just start working. And, uh, we just started picking up people and 
they were, uh, you know, they, they weren't too bad in the beginning. They were mostly just scared. But um, like you said, there were so many people that three, four days into it, six days later, we're still picking up people, you know, and by that time they're dehydrated, they're malnourished, you know, they're sunburned, there's all kinds of stuff going on. So uh, the beginning was just, it, I, it's exhilarating to, to get to do what you know how to do, you know, and I love, uh, like, I, I think of my gift is, is I, I can help people in bad situations, you know, I'm, I'm okay with it, I'm not worried. So if I can be calm, cool, collected and help these people and just smile, you know, I'm like, Hey, did you pay your taxes this year? Yeah. Okay. Well I'm your tax return, you know, or I'm here from the government. <laughs> it's a good way to phrase <laughs> that. <laughs> I'm here to help, you know, and, and, in every action movie, you're not, you know, if someone says I'm here from the government, I'm here to help run. And uh, so they would smile, but just anything to, you know, lighten the situation and, and people, you know, like, well, I was really scared, but then, this guy smiled at me and I thought, well, it's not that bad. So, you know, and it may have been horrible, but you know, I can fake a smile pretty good to keep people calm. So I can do what I need to do. Uh, I'll ask you about one particular rescue, the name Lachey Brown. Uh, tell us that story, please. Yes, sir. So on the, uh, the sixth day, well, so on the third day I had, I have this problem with smiling and maybe I talked too much, but I, I was picking up a guy and he and I slipped off the roof of the van and I, we fell into the water and I drank the water. Um, I don't know if you've ever, well, all right. So Lake Ponce train is this horrible, horrible brackish, dirty water. Who knows how many cars or bodies are in there. That's what broke through the levee. The water raised the level of the, uh, sewage. Uh, there were alligators in the water. I saw an alligator eating a person, uh, oh, yeah, it, it was, it was not good. So on the third day I go into the water, suck up a bunch of it. And for 21 days later, I'm sick and dying, you know, but I, I didn't tell anybody cause I really wanted to do my job. So I just kept popping, uh, stomach pills and stuff and praying. And so on, on the sixth day we're, we're flying around and it's 8am and we pick up this guy who's having a heart attack and like I said, I'm a paramedic, but we weren't allowed to, you know, use any medicine or do anything because we were afraid that we'd get sued. So they're like, you're not allowed to do any medicine on anybody. So the only thing I could do was uh, cover this guy's eyes from the sun and give him oxygen and just, you know, tell the pilot we need to fly faster. And we drop him off. And I haven't slept in three days. And I'm I'm kind of bummed. I'm like, oh, you know, like, this is horrible. I, I What good am I if I can't, you know, perform medicine? And, and how many other people are out there having heart attacks and stuff that we can't help. So we go back up, we're flying about 10 o'clock. Uh, we pick up this guy and he says, Hey, I know these little old ladies that are in their house. They got no electricity and no one knows they're there. And we're like, yeah, dude, show us where they're at. So went down, uh, the street and he went down and sure enough, there are two ladies. The one lady had been in a coma for seven years. Oh my God. And, and nobody knew they were there, you know, thank God for the, uh, the kindness of their neighbor. And so I pick her up, bring her out, go up on the hoist, go back, pick up her sister. And it's a, it's a quick flight to uh, new Orleans international. And, and on the, I'm just like, Oh, you know, how, how many little old ladies are out there and no one knows that they're there because no one's going to tell us. So, oh. so the day's like weighing pretty heavy on me. Um, at noon, we're, we're east of the Superdome and we're coming around these crops of tree or this bunch of trees. And I see this family walking out into the, um, the road and I'm like, Hey, uh, contact, you know, 11 o'clock. And they're like, ah, oh, we got them. And so they lowered me down and, uh, I, I grew up, uh, 1984 being a huge fan of Mary Lou Retton because mm -hmm. she was short. Yep. And uh, so, you know how um, gymnasts will stick their landing? Yes. So when I come out of the helicopter, a lot of times I'll come in down inverted and at the last minute I will flip over and stick my landing. And uh, I get very strange looks from people, but you know, I'm like, ta-da, smiling at them. And, uh, you know, I'm like, Hey, you want to go for a helicopter ride? And this little girl looks at me and she's like, yes. And she's got a pink shirt on and pigtails and the biggest smile I've ever seen. And I'm kind of like, 
this girl's been, you know, in a storm and who knows what's been going on for the last six days. And she's smiling. Hmm. All right. Maybe it's not that bad. So, uh, I get her. She's about three. And, and the way that I figured she was about three was she was, uh, about the same size as, uh, my son, Christopher. So, you know, I'm like, Hey, so I wrap her up with our, our strap a couple times cause she's not very big and I'm hanging on to her and I give the signal and we're going up the hoist. And as we're going up the hoist, she's like wiggling in and out of my arms cause she's trying to look and she says, there's my school, there's my gymnasium, there's my restaurant, you know, like all the things she's pointing out to me. So I get her up to the top of the helicopter and I, and I tell her, I'm like, okay, stay on the other side of the, the helicopter because on, on the right side of the door is where we got the, the hoist so the left side's closed. I'm like, stay over there, don't touch anything, you'll be fine. And so when I leave, she's looking all over and, and having a blast. So I went down and picked up the rest of her family and when I got them up, uh, helicopters are very loud and there's a lot of shaking going on and her mom's crying and the little girl, cause that was all I knew what her name was until about three years ago. Uh, she's rubbing her back and she says, it's okay, mom, we're safe now. And to me, she wasn't just talking to her mom. She was talking to me. I mean, nobody was trying to kill me. Nothing bad was going on. Sure. It was bad for everybody else, but you know, I'm on a helicopter, uh, safe. So, I, I kind of smiled at her, and when we landed, what we would do is we would help the people off, and then FEMA would take them to wherever they were taking them. And when she, when I went to go pick her up to take her off, she wraps me up in this hug, and I was, my head didn't hurt, my heart didn't hurt, my stomach didn't hurt. I felt great, and uh, I put her down, and uh, we got back on the helicopter. I still had about eight hours of flying around to go pick up people. And so I told her, I'm like, you know, you fill your cup up where you can, you know, and, and the universe knew that I needed a hug at that moment because I was just having a bad day. And and it kept me going on through that day and kept me going on for another 14 days of picking up people and, you know, kept me, you know, 20 years later, here we are talking about it and uh, or 15. But um, it, it was a magical moment, you know, and, and I think if you keep your eyes open for those events and those things and appreciate what comes your way. And, and as a PJ, seen a lot of death. Uh, I appreciate every single thing, every single day. I'm just like happy. There is a picture of this event of her getting off the helicopter. Uh, and this is a three-year-old girl who's smiling like she just got her favorite toy on Christmas from Santa Claus. And you can kind of see the, the smile of relief on your face where, you know, you I mean, you're still in uniform and, You've got all your kid on and everything else. This is a three-year-old who doesn't care. She's just smiling almost because of just the joy she feels. Did you know that picture was being taken? I did not. Um, so what was funny is they they made us take combat camera with us, and I was, all, I was like, that's three more people who can't fit in the helicopter. I don't want no fucking camera. <laughs> so I'm like, ah, you know. And uh, I didn't know they were taking the picture. But, and the, the Air Force hated that picture. My sunglasses are on my forehead, you know, all kinds of stuff. They they were not happy with that picture. And um, the the photographer said, "Hey, I, I got some good photos of you." And so that night, I, I stopped by their uh, their room, and they showed me that picture. And I and they're like, "Yeah, the Air Force doesn't like it." I'm like, "I don't care. I'm the, this is the picture that sums up my life. You know, this is why I was here. You know, if if the only thing I I ever get with a hug from this little girl, then, you know, that's it. I'm, I'm happy. And, uh, yeah, it blew me away that they, they took it because I, I had no idea. I was not even on the planet at the time of the picture. I want to put the picture on pause because that turns us to a happy place, but I do want to ask a couple of questions about your job that seem fairly, you know, natural through the course of what happens. Um, a lot of guys in your line of work have a hard time remembering their best rescues, but can recall with incredible accuracy the failures, the rescues that they couldn't uh-huh. get. Um, oh. If you're open to sharing a story like that, I'd love to hear it. But, I mean, what is that like for you? Because I'm sure in your heart you want to save everybody, but you know you can't. It is the worst feeling ever. And uh, I'll tell you about the the first life that I couldn't save because we weren't prepared. Um, 
I was in Kuwait and we were doing Southern Watch. And uh, there was a fisherman who'd been bitten by a shark and in, in the Gulf. And so I said, yeah, let's go. So we started heading over. Well, one somebody on the plane didn't have their flotation with them. And I said, you can have my flotation. I'm a beach. I don't need a flotation. I can swim. We're fine. Uh, they said no. They didn't feel safe. Uh, we didn't go on the mission. We, we ended up turning around and coming back. Uh, and the guy died. And I, from that moment, I made sure that I had everything that I would need at all times. Like, you know, we would have our snow gear with us in Iraq. There's no snow in Iraq, but uh, there could be an earthquake in Iran or on the way home. And this happened in 2000. We were on our way back from Turkey uh, and we got rerouted to a super typhoon that had hit um, Mozambique. And, you know, we weren't doing water work in Turkey, but we had every single piece of equipment that we could use just in case because you never know. And, uh, so that one really bothered me. Um, the, the, yes, I would agree that I, I can remember very vividly the, the times that I didn't get to rescue somebody or the times that, um, you know, the, in Iraq. So, um, the services have the, uh, the right to go rescue their own people. Uh, mm -hmm. first there was a, a Marine, um, Deuce and a half, they got hit by a flood, you got uh, uh, somewhere hit them. And we had just gotten back from doing a course of dangling from a helicopter while going down a river and, and, you know, how much slack you need and how to do this. And, you know, and so we were totally prepared, but the, the Marine Corps said no. And so two days later, we're doing pickups just for body recovery. Okay. And, you know, so that was kind of a, I, I, my my story is if if I'm in rescue or I need to be rescued, send the Girl Scouts, the Cub Scouts, the JCs. I don't care. I'll take help from anybody. I'm not too proud to you know step on a, a, another services helicopter. Or, you know, accept help from somebody else. Is that something that keeps you up at night? Uh, I wouldn't say it keeps me up at night, but it definitely I I try to make sure that when I'm speaking to people that, you know, pride is not a pride, pride and ego. You can just throw that shit out the door. You know, all of us are replaceable. Um, nobody is that important and, and all lives matter. So do your job, do the right thing. And, um, you know, and I just try to learn from my mistakes. Don't make the same mistake. And, uh, if I can help young people, uh, or old people too, you know, not make the same mistakes I made, then, then I'm doing all right. I know the environments are different, so it's not a straight line comparison, but doing what you had to do in Katrina versus what you did in Iraq, Afghanistan type environment um, being shot at, is it fair to compare them? I mean, is it just a rescue is a rescue to you? The surrounding circumstances don't matter. How do you view the two? Uh, for me, I'll rescue anybody, anywhere, anytime. Like I'm, I'm easy. I'm, I'm a rescue whore. I'll go anywhere. Just let me help people. Um, but I will say that you are maybe a little bit more, uh, alert. You know, we were during Katrina, we were looking for wires or birds or other helicopters, uh, things like that. But, you know, in Iraq or Afghanistan, you're looking for a whole lot more. So I would say that the, uh, the adrenaline's a little bit more up, but, um, I don't, I wouldn't say, oh, I prefer getting – actually, I would say I prefer uh, peacetime uh, just because I'm only worried about helping people versus wartime. You know, it, it, war's a good time until your friends start dying, and then, you know, you're like, oh, all right, we're not invincible, and maybe this isn't as much a fun or as a glorious adventure as I thought it would be. Um, you know, and that's just because you meet some really, really good people in the military. I mean, just – uh, service, you know, and, and beautiful human beings, you know, from all, all over the country. So when you lose somebody that you've sweat, bled and almost died with, you know, maybe it, it hits you a little bit more, a little bit worse, or, you know, I, I think I didn't feel close to anybody, uh, except for, you know, the other PJs and controllers that I worked with and until I had my own kids. And then I was like, Oh, okay. These people are me. I understand now. <laughs> 
All right, Mike, let's talk about some of the other kind of major involvements you had throughout your career, uh, you know, again, 20 years and over 5,000 jumps. But one of the more notable sort of operations you were, I guess, tangentially tied to was Roberts Ridge and the Battle of Tackergar. And Tackergar is a battle we've, we've discussed plenty of times here. Uh, but Neil Roberts was the first Navy SEAL killed in action in Afghanistan during the outset of the war. And this was in March of of 2002. And essentially what happened to Neil Roberts, for those who don't know the story, is he fell out of the back of a helicopter onto the side of a mountain in Afghanistan. It was basically surrounded. And so there was a major rescue effort to go get him out alive. So kind of tell me where you come from in this, what you had heard and and how the whole thing fits in with, um, you know, you being a, a PJ. So uh, at this time, I was in Jacobabad, which was a secret base in Pakistan. Uh, you know, sometimes we'd see articles about secret base in Pakistan. We're like, oh, I think they're talking about us. And I was on a C-130 mission. And uh, so most of the time, we were doing transloads uh, from helicopters or flying around. You know, somebody was messed up. and But we were also a, a jump team and with uh, Halo and, you know, just static line uh, capabilities. And so we got the call that, uh, when the second helicopter had gone down, cause that was their QRF. So we were their QRF. So we got the call, got in the helicopter and got in the uh, plane and flew over and was ready to go. And we were 30 seconds from jumping into it. And, but they were being so overwhelmed by enemy fire that the, the controllers on the ground were just dropping bombs and they couldn't afford to let up. So we circled for four hours until we ran out of gas and then limped home. And, you know, everyone everyone gives the poor SEALs a hard time for leaving Chapman, but we left Cunningham. We left all those other guys on, on the mountain, too. So it was a very rough, tough day. You know, we got back home and we were making jokes and uh, somebody was like, didn't that guy just die? I'm like, yeah, but, you know, it's a lot better to be making jokes and crying. So it's OK. Yeah. Um, so that was when I think my dark humor really started turning up was after that day because I was taught as a PJ that I would always get to go rescue people. And, you know, from Vietnam, we'd lose eight helicopters to rescue one pilot, you know, because that's what life is, is worth, you know, and because of it's that others may live. And so, you know, the, the guilt and just horrible feelings of one leaving, you know, airmen and soldiers behind, but two leave one of our own. Um, cause it was, it was too dangerous. So the army said nobody else could fly during the day and, uh, they had to wait till night fall before they could go get them. And by the time they got them, you know, most of the guys were dead anyway. So it's just a really, really rough day among rough days. Yeah. And, you know, again, as I've said, we, we've dissected Tacker Gar from, uh, uh, several different angles on the podcast, including talking to Nate self and, and other people who were on that mountaintop, um, that feeling of helplessness and not being able to do enough, how much does that eat at you? Oh, it, it ate me up for a long time. I think I finally got over it maybe a couple of years ago, but it just, because what could you do? You know, I'm, um, I had had instances where, you know, we didn't get to do things and, and people died and, you know, it sucked and, and it, it dwells in there. But, but this one, uh, Jason Cunningham and I, uh, were friends. We had the same supervisor. We were both senior airmen together. Uh, lockers were right next to each other. Um, you know, that was a, well, uh, two weeks before, uh, a guy that I graduated with named Bill McDaniel and another guy that was a class in front of me, uh, Juan Rideau, they died when their helicopter crashed into the uh, South China Sea in the Philippines. And uh, so it was just February, March, just bad months for pararescue. Did you know John Chapman? I mean, how well did you know him? I, I knew him very well. Um, kids played together. Uh, like I said, we had the same supervisor. So, I mean, we're sitting in the same office together talking. Real nice guy. Uh, real smart guy, too. I mean, uh, he was always busy on the weekends, like in, in the shop. Um, he made this where he took the ruck, took the Alice ruck, and he put zippers on the side. And uh, so you could just, and, you know, get to everything quicker. Uh, made it heavier, but um, it, it was a pretty good idea. I mean, he was, he was a real nice man. 
And for those who don't know, John Chapman was an Air Force combat controller on the side of the mountain trying to find Neil Roberts, who posthumously was awarded the Medal of Honor. And if you, if you check on the internet, there is uh, infrared footage of everything that Chapman did on that mountain. You know, he was he was shot and went down, and then like 10 minutes later got back up, re-engaged the enemy. It's just incredible heroism and what he went through. Uh, and unfortunately, he you know, he was, he was killed on the side of that mountain, but it wasn't without valor and, and everything else. And when you heard after the fact everything that John had done and what he went through, what did that mean to you? Did it hit you at all? It did. You know, it's funny. Um, I don't know if you want to know funny. So I started a journal when I was in, in, in Indoc. My, my godfather said, you know, keep track of what you do every day. And um, I, was, I wrote on, you know, a couple of days later that I was proud, you know, that he had done that, you know, gone down swinging. And, yeah, it sucks that he died. But if, if you give everything you got up until the end, I mean, that's all you can ask of a person. And, and the fact that he did that and, and, uh, so he, Jason, uh, Cunningham also, he received the Air Force Cross and then, uh, Chapman, his was Air Force Cross, but they, uh, um, upgraded it. Yeah. Upgraded. upgraded thank yeah. you. Upgraded to the Medal of Honor, which if we saw that footage, uh, probably about three days after everything happened and just watching it, my mouth was on the, I mean, just John Chapman running up that hill shooting, I mean, and you could see from the footage, just, you know, it was, oh, I mean, it was crazy. And you know how deep the snow was. So, mm-hmm. I mean, going up a mountain at that altitude, at that speed with all your kit on, uh, that's pretty impressive. So, uh, yeah, both those guys just, the, the speaks to the ability of a, of a human being and what you can accomplish, you know, if, well, one, if I guess your life is on the line, but two, you know, when you're when you're dedicated to your cause. Let's move on from uh, Tacker Gar and the other major sort of incident that you were, again, tangentially tied to. Uh, and I say that not as a, a slight, but just the 2004 Madrid train bombings. Uh, you weren't there for them, but uh, it ends up that you end up sort of helping to capture one of the perpetrators. Is that correct? Uh, yes, something like so. We flew around in a helicopter att- assault force. We had uh, four helos loaded with dudes uh, and a bunch of little birds flying with us, and we just flew around because this this part of um, Baghdad was notorious for shooting down helicopters. And we'd been trying to get in there for a couple days. They were they were looking for this guy. They thought that they had um, the third mastermind for the Madrid bombing. And they also thought that this was a where the uh, weapons were coming that were taking out our helicopters. And so uh, we were the QRF. So the Army landed. As soon as they landed, uh, a Green Beret was shot and killed. Uh, so they backed up and uh, brought in two, two of the Little Birds came in, Winchestered everything they had, and then they brought in an F-16 and leveled the building and so then we all landed and just had to dig through the rubble for the bodies. And uh, so we took the bodies and we put them in the back of our helicopter and we took them to a um, to a safe house where the FBI was waiting and they got fingerprints and, and it turned out to be the, the guy that they had been looking for. And I think after that, they also that area kind of calmed down for shooting down helicopters. But uh, the Red Triangle, it was a really bad part of town. They were always shooting down somebody. Do you ever marvel at both, you know, the Madrid bomber and, and uh, attacker Gar, the level of incidents that you've been tied to or have worked closely to? I mean, you know, there are a lot of guys who have served a really long time who, uh, I, I guess, you know, in their own experience, do amazing things in their own ways. But it's just kind of weird that these more notable things you, you seem to keep popping up with. It. I, you know what, and I guess if you want to call it luck, uh, for as lucky as I am, there are guys that were even luckier and got on even more missions, you know. But I, I did feel very lucky to be seeing, you know, history in the making, you know, or, or being there. I mean, it's like being there when the Constitution got signed or something. I mean, getting to see some of these events and, and unfold and then knowing the history and, you know, just being able to look back now and go, Okay, I guess you know because sometimes I I feel like I didn't get to do enough, and so I 
I don't know if it's an addiction or something, but you know, I just never felt like I got to do enough. We talk about stuff staying with you. Uh, how do you rid of that? I mean, I know you mentioned with Roberts Ridge that you, you kind of expelled it a couple of years ago, but what's the process that you mentally went through to sort of expel those things? You know, the, the, the saves you couldn't make, so to speak. Right. So I surf a lot. I like sitting out in the ocean. Uh, I like sensory deprivation tanks. Uh, I like to go do yoga. I, I look at my kids. You know, I try to appreciate every single thing that, that is good. And, you know, and I, I tell people, I'm like, look, prayer rescue is the greatest job you can have. You get paid to fall out of airplanes. You get paid to get drunk. You get paid to go all over the world and do all kinds of things. And occasionally you have some bad days. And, and on those bad days, they may be the worst day ever, you know, but did everybody die? Did most of us live? Did how how the day turn out? Did we win? Did we not? You know, any little grasp of a of a victory or a win that I can grab onto and hold onto and say, okay, most of us didn't die today. We're good, you know. And and then you remember your buddies. And if you remember your buddies, then they're never really gone. You know, they're just maybe PCS somewhere. And and I also speak regularly um, here at the NCO Academy or the First Term Airman Center, or you know I spoke at the the Naval Academy, and I just go and I tell people about my friends, and I, I tell them about what they did, you know, and I remind them of the the rich history that is the American fighting person, that what we have done, what they gave before us, and you know, because you, you go back to uh, Gladiator, you know, and. Um, Maximus says, death smiles at us all. All a brave man can do is smile back. Mm -hmm. You know, so every day above ground is a good day, and you just do the best you can. Well, I think it's excellent advice. I mean, you know, uh, everybody deals with this stuff in their own way, right? Like, no, there is no one set cookie cutter way for uh -huh. uh, anybody who goes through this kind of thing to come out, you know, clean in the end and be like, I'm okay now. So everybody, you know, has a, a way to deal with it. But, you know, I, I think that one of the great things about this podcast is that when I ask that question, everybody kind of vocalizes their process. Maybe there's something in your process that someone else can relate to that all of a sudden right. says, all right, that's that's what I can use. That's how I can do it and uh, find a way to make it work for them. And I think that's really, you know, the the most important part of some of these discussions is is for people to vocalize that process. So maybe somebody else relates to it and says, OK, I'm going to be OK. Exactly. Because if I can do it, you can do it. And and my path's not necessarily your path, but there might be, oh, maybe I could try that. Maybe I tell everyone to, to talk. You know, I know none of us, we're not really talkers. And maybe you don't want to go talk to, you know, psych or something because you're afraid it'll go on your record. But everybody's got friends or everybody's got an uncle or everybody's got somebody that they should be able to talk to. You know, and if you don't have those kind of friends, then maybe you're not looking around good enough or maybe you know you don't realize what you have but i mean i've got dudes i could call right now and if i'm having a bad day they would be on an airplane in the next couple hours to come help me you know and i never called that you know favor in or anything but i know that they would and i know that i've done that like when you know i got some friends that are uh, a little bit rougher than me on some things. And, you know, you get a call, phone call at three o'clock in the morning and you're like, oh, hello, dude, dude, what's up? You know, and, and I'm awake and, and you're there. So it, it, I think that's uh, Sebastian Younger's, uh, that book, uh, Tribes, you know, that's what we are. We are a tribe. We are a village. We're all here for each other and we need, we all need to be there for each other, you know? So, Maybe you can't be up at three o'clock in the morning when they call, but you know, seven o'clock in the morning when you wake up, Hey dude, you good? What's up? You know? And then being there for each other and letting someone talk to you, uh, I think really makes a difference. So if you can't talk to a professional, although maybe you should think about talking to a professional, at least if you've got, you know, a buddy or a sister or somebody you can, Hey, I need to talk and just let that shit out because the longer you leave it in there, Ugh, the worse it hurts, the more damage it does, you know, and, and you're just missing out on, you know, sunsets so or your kids' smiles or, you know, the, the things that are important in life. Perfectly said, man. Perfectly said. So let's get back to Lachey Brown for a minute. Um, that photo 
that uh, at the time wasn't famous, uh, you had decided to try and track down this little girl. What was the reason for that? So after about five years, uh, after Katrina, I was like, I wonder what happened to her and her family. And so I, I put it on uh, MySpace, and uh, I, the the most I ever got was 152 likes. And every year, you know, on on the day, I would put it out and just, hey, anybody know anything? I wrote Oprah; she never wrote me back. Um, but on the the ninth year, uh, a young man named Andrew, who's actually in the Air Force now, he wrote me and said, "It's my life's work. I am going to help you find this little girl if it kills me." And and he was 15 at the time, and I wrote him back. I'm like, hey, dude, that's super cool. I appreciate it, but I've been looking for her for nine years, and I've had no luck. The very next day, he he has an Instagram page. The very next day, he's got 3,300 likes. I don't. I didn't have 3,300 likes the entire time I was looking, <laughs> <laughs> and it blows up. And uh, two days later, I'm getting called by the uh, Washington Post and the Air Force Times, and they're like, hey, we want to run with this story. And I'm like, yes, please. And so for the next three weeks, I'm doing like nine interviews a day, Fox news, everybody just, you know, looking for, and, uh, she found us and wrote my son on Instagram and, uh, within three months. So I'm like, Oh, you know, and and so I called them and we're talking and trying to figure out when we can get, because they're living in uh, Waveland, Mississippi at the time. And so they filled me up on the best story. So we we dropped them off. The FEMA took them. They flew them up to Nashville. They were in a, um, not a refugee camp, uh, uh, a shelter. So they were in a shelter for a number of years. They tried to move back to New Orleans, but uh, her mom was still worried about the floods. So they were living in Waveland, Mississippi. And, you know, so we're trying to figure out how we're going to meet. And so then all uh, these shows start calling The View, uh, Steve Harvey, um, all these people. And so there's this show called The Real called and said, we'll give the family $20,000 if you come on our show. And I'm like, sold. Yes, please. And, um, you know, cause I, I, 20, 000, if I could give this family 20 million, you know, I would, I would give them because she gave me a hug on a day that I really needed a hug. And so we went on the reel and they flew us out to LA and was crazy as she was like in the room next to me. And I, and I couldn't see, you know, I've been waiting 10 years to meet her right. and, and see, see what happened. And, and she's in the next room. I'm pacing, I'm sweating. I'm like, Oh, you know, so like it was my wedding day or something. And, uh, I was finally, you know, they, they brought me out. And what was funny is, um, so they they were showing like Katrina videos while I was coming out. And while I'm standing out there waiting for them to say, you know, come out, they, uh, uh, there's a picture, and I had forgotten about this. So, helicopter downwashes is, is pretty bad, and if you've got loose shingles on your house, they they will fly up at you. And so, when you're coming down, um, I got all kinds of little nicks from flying debris at me. And so, I'm standing next to this screen, and they're showing it, and and I start dodging. And the guy looked at me, and he's like, "What are you doing?" I'm like because I could see the, the shingles flying around. And so I told him real quick, I'm like, ooh. And so I go out and uh, I'm sitting out there and, you know, and they're asking me questions and, you know, I'm just like, please, you know, let's, I, I want to see, you know, how her mom turned out. And uh, they bring her out, you know, and she's six feet tall. And like I said, I'm five, five. So they're <laughs> like, you, you grew, <laughs> you know? And it sort of was laughing. And, um, she, I mean, I was pretty nervous. Uh, what's funny is I, like, I was talking to some friends of mine before I went on, and they're like, well, what are you worried about? I'm like, well, I don't want to cry on national television. Like, that seems like the worst idea. And they're like, but I think it's okay, you know? And, you know, I, mean, I always say John Wayne never cried on stage, you know? He waited until he got off, you know, and you handle it like a, a man. But when you got to take care of things, take care of things. So I'm trying not to, you know, tear up. Um, and so she she's scared i mean she's on national television she's 13 years old and you know here's this dude she met once doesn't really remember her mom remembered me 
And um, so she's, you know, scared. So they're like, okay, well, Mike, what are you thinking? You know, and I, I just laid it out and said, you know, you rescued me more than I rescued you. You know, this is so much more. All I did was help you out physically, but you helped me out mentally, physically, and spiritually. And everybody, the cameramen are crying. Everybody's crying. So I, I figured it was okay because if, if I'm going to cry, I'm taking all of America with me. And so uh, it was a really beautiful moment. And, you know, we went and got chocolate shakes and talked to her and her mom. And uh, we've kept in contact ever since. That's amazing. Um, any words that her mom said to you, you know, after the fact that she was so distraught on that helicopter, um, you know, that kind of stay with you? No, I, I just remember her mom, you know, with, with tears in her eyes. And, you know, and when we were taking her off the helicopter, I, you know, was patting her on the back. I'm like, it's okay. You're like, you're, you're good now. Don't worry. And, uh, you know, and then when she saw me, she, she remembered me and I remember her and gave her a big hug. And, uh, she's a taller woman too. So, um, they both. <laughs> so when you look back on, you know, the experience of Katrina and the experience of, you know, deploying and rescuing. I know you talked about, you know, the civilian world and rescues there, but uh, what are some of the hardest lessons you had to learn in those experiences, rescuing people in those environments? Well, like, um, pilots notoriously don't drink water. So that they're, because it helps with their G suit and, you know, they, they're flying around. So they have time to pee. So if you pick up somebody, they're already dehydrated. They're already behind the power curve, throw in a, a, a cut here and a bleed there, you know, head trauma, who knows what's going on. So, uh, I'm a big fan, uh, Jocko Willink, you know, and he says, be prepared, you know, and I think of myself as just a, a Cub Scout, you know, cause I was a Cub Scout. And, and the motto is always be prepared. And what is uh, a PJ if not uh, a, an overgrown Cub Scout with a bigger tool bag of things that you get to play with and do? And so be prepared because, you know, you know, you work in an office, okay? Well, that doesn't mean you shouldn't be hydrated because, say, you're driving home in, in San Antonio in the middle of the summer. You could die <laughs> changing a tire and not only being run over, but, you know, because it's hot. So – drink water, be prepared, you know, have extra stuff, you know, because if you don't take it with you, you know, look at, uh, Black Hawk down, you know, right. it's going to be a quick yeah. mission. We don't need MVGs or what I always extra batteries, water, all the ammo I can carry, you know, because you never know what's going to happen. Oh yeah. Um, I, I went through that in Iraq. One of my, one of my last missions without a roadmap figured I knew where I was going. And of course we got diverted and I had no map. So I learned that one the hard way myself. Yep. And but we're, we're lucky we learn from our mistakes, and then we don't make that mistake again. <laughs> In theory, sure, yeah. Uh, <laughs> so you did this for twenty years. Was it something where you knew it was time to give it up, or you knew you wanted to move on to the next phase of your life? Why did you end up leaving the Air Force? I was broke. Um, I like got physically. Artificial, physically, yeah. I got an artificial disc in my neck. Uh, I got a traumatic brain injury. Uh, I got that broke broke ankle. Both my shoulders were torn. Uh, at at seventeen, I was pretty much just instructing after that because I my body was too beat up. Did it so bother it, it you? Wasn't... Did did it bother you that your, your your sort of body quit on you? I mean, did you want to keep doing it? Oh yeah, no, I'd have kept doing it if I could. Um, the other thing was, so in two thousand five, two thousand six, um, my my ex wife had some. Um, medical issues and it wasn't going very well. Uh, she tried to kill herself and, uh, the kids weren't doing very well. And her, her dad said, why are you still with her? And I, I said, okay, this is what I got to do to keep my kids safe. So in 2006, I'm an active duty pararescue man. I've got a two year old and a six month old. I'm gone six months out of the year. The other six months out of the year, I'm getting ready to go back uh, and so in, in 2006, I, I call home, you know, talk to my kids and my mom's like, you need to talk to your son. I'm like, why? He's getting in fights. He's four years old. I'm like, we need he's getting in fights. And she's like, uh, he's beating up kids. So I, I get him on the phone. I'm like, Hey buddy, what's up? Why are you beating up these kids? And he says, because they have parents. And I was like, Oh my God. And I was supposed to reenlist. And I told him, I'm like, I can't reenlist. And a lot of people were angry. 
um, you know, you're leaving the team and stuff like that. But like I said, uh, service for self in all things, unless, you know, your family and I was the only thing that the two of them had. So I was like, um, yeah. So I got out, joined the reserve, and then I became an instructor here at Lackland at the indoctrination course. And that was the best thing that could happen for the boys and I. And uh, my last appointment was in 2010. And then um, I was too broke after that. Uh, I, my last jump was in 2013. And then, uh, you know, so I just instructed and was uh, going through a med board because I had to get surgeries. And um, oh, I also uh, have a had a heart murmur that nobody had ever caught until this doctor who was giving me um, uh, spinal injections hit something, put my heart into a lethal rhythm, called a code. Everybody freaked out, uh, but I was fine. And uh, so after them checking me out, they eventually found out that I had a heart murmur that nobody had ever caught. I, I, and um, the, the class three flight physical is pretty demanding. They do, you know, EKG and all kinds of stuff. And mm-hmm. I, I've been good enough to, to get through. So uh, they had to fix that. So that was a, a, a good find. Um, but so it, it took me a couple of years to, uh, get medically boarded out, but yeah, I, I would have stayed and kept doing it. I didn't want to be an instructor, like coming to be an instructor to me seemed the worst idea ever because I'm like, I don't want to teach these guys. I want to go rescue people. You know, this, uh, screw this. And, uh, but then after being an instructor for a while, I kind of, you, you know, cause eventually you get either too old or too broke to do your job. So if you can still have some relevancy and, and help out with the fight when, when I was a young student and broke, uh, there was a PJ named Mike Mahoney, and my name's Mike Maroney. And uh, he took pity on me because, you know, two Irishmen. And he uh, he's, he had, at that point, lost his beret and was just doing a regular desk job. And I'm like, they took away your hat? You know, and I would, I'm raging, like, oh, my God, dude, I'm, that's horrible. Let's get your hat back. And he's like, Maroney, relax. He's like, it's just a hat. You know, he said, men wear hats throughout their lives, you know. You wear many hats. You're a father. You're a brother. You're this. You're that. It's just a hat. Don't worry about it. And so, uh, in my head, I'm like, and and he he's like, look, Maroney, I can't rescue anybody anymore. But if I help you and you go rescue people, therefore I am still rescuing people. And so I I took that with me to heart, and you know, and that's what I did. I'm like, all right, I'll, as long as somebody's rescuing somebody, you know, and I'm a part of it and helping out, then that's okay. I've mentioned this a couple of times, but I just kind of want to verbalize it for the audience and and get your reaction to it. So over 5,300 rescues in a 20-year career, you do the math of that, uh, that's 5.12 rescues each week for 20 years straight. You rescued or saved a life of a human every 1.3 days for 20 consecutive years. Um, When you hear that, what do you think of and kind of what's the reaction to it? I wish I could have saved more, you know, like you're saying that the guys remember what they did wrong. I, I wanted to save everybody and make sure everybody, you know, got to go home and see their families. And maybe this guy gets to uh, go be the president of the United States or something. You never know what somebody might do with their life after you've helped them out. So I always wanted more. Um, but, I, but I do appreciate that I did get to help that many people and, uh, you know, and the world's so kind of bleak and distraught these days that if you can bring even a little bit of hope or a little smile to somebody's face, you know, I think I've, that that's the job I'm here for. If I was a bright-eyed, young, 18-year-old kid and I told Mike Maroney right now, I wanted to be a pararescueman jumper, what would you tell to me? Uh, I would ask you, how's your water confidence? I would ask you, do you like suffering? Do you like being miserable? Do you like being hot? Do you like being shot at? Do you like working long hours? Are you, are you wanting to be an Olympic athlete, but for a real reason, instead of just a piece of gold? Because, um, I mean, that's that's all, well, most operators, you know, whether soft or not, that's it's some hard stuff. So being a PJ, being a SEAL, being a Green Beret, being a Ranger, I mean, that is Olympic level, level athlete or athleticism that you need to do. And so do more. Uh, one of my favorite cones, we were doing underwaters, and one of the guys was like, how many more of these are we going to do? And he looked at him and he said, all of them. 
And I was like, oh, <laughs> like I was like, I love this kid, and he's a PJ now, and he's a really good dude. And but just the the excitement and the you know getting to to work with people and getting to do great things and getting to see what your body can do, and and what the human mind and and you know because it doesn't matter. I'm like, oh, I'm fine. I can do this. You know, look at David Goggins. You know, look at these these guys that run these ultra marathons and just go 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 go. And it's, it's all in your head. You know, if you believe that you can't, then you're exactly right. You won't. But if you believe that you can, you got at least a 50, 50 shot, you know? So if you don't quit, this is, this, this is what I'll give you. Cause this is all I knew from pararescue. I met a pararescue man once before I came in, my recruiter found a guy and, and he came to talk to me and I was all excited, you know? So I'm asking him all these questions and I'm like, what's in doc like? I can't tell you. Uh, how far do you run? I can't tell you. Uh, what's water confidence? I can't tell you. And for a half an hour, I'm asking him questions because I, I figured it was like some smart guru. You know, he's waiting for me to ask the right question. And I, I finally just said, all right, what can you tell me? And he says, I can tell you that you need to train like you're going to die before you quit. And since you're not going to die because they're PJs, they're not going to let you die. And you're not going to quit. You have no other option but to pass. And, and that's life. My, my whole life is I'm not going to die. If I die, then it's done. So it doesn't matter. I'm not going to quit. So my other, only other option is to, to pass. I'll ask a similar question. Uh, you've been out for over a year now. Obviously, you hadn't had a jump in a long time. What would you tell 18-year-old Mike Maroney about being a pararescue man jumper? I would tell him to uh, not be afraid of going to medical, maybe not during the indoc, get through, but I would have paid a lot more attention. Uh, there was, I think in like 04, uh, we were doing a lot of water work and I had pneumonia for like three months. And because every time I'm like, okay, I'm feeling better, you know, we're shorthanded. There's not enough guys. You got to get back out. So I would get off of, I get back on flying status, get back in the water and then two weeks later, you know, I'm sick again. And uh, so I, I would say pay attention to uh, your body a little bit better because I think that if I had and not been afraid, you know, to come forward and say, hey, you know, my shoulder's torn, my ankle's broke, you know, that I could have had time to heal. And then on time with that, if you're ever having surgery, you know, and they're like, hey, it's going to be two to four months for you to recover, uh, take the time, be kind to your body, let it heal. Because I would be like, okay, I'm good. Feel, oh yeah. Yeah. Everything's feeling good. And then I would re injure myself. So, uh, but I think people are smarter these days that I was, a uh, just put your head down and, and just survive. And, uh, so, you know, now with stretching, uh, you know, people have all kinds of, uh, the physical therapy and, and stuff that can help you take advantage of that. And, uh, and keep going. Well, Mike, an amazing career, uh, a notable one to say the least, and a lot of highs and a lot of lows. But uh, in the end, you know, I, I feel like you're thankful for the career that you had and wouldn't change much about it. Nope. Well, look, again, uh, thank you for sharing your story. Thank you for being so honest with us. And uh, certainly, uh, we wish you nothing but the best of luck going forward. And certainly, thank you for being part of the Hazard Ground. Yes, sir. Thank you for having me. You've been listening to the Hazard Ground Podcast, hosted by Mark Zeno and produced by Matt Pascarella. If you have an interesting story to tell and you'd like to be on the show, send us an email at hazardgroundpodcast at gmail.com. And if you like the show, don't forget to subscribe, rate, and review on iTunes. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time.